All right, it's 10.03, so I think we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Conover, President and CEO of the York County Community Foundation. Thank you all for joining us today for our annual event to thank the professional advisors in our community for encouraging charitable giving. You all help make your county a great place to live. I'm going to start with a few housekeeping items, just so we're, um, we're staying clean and, 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 and tidy. The session is re being recorded, as you may have known. Uh, the participant videos are turned off, so I can't see what you're wearing, so feel free to uh, move around. Uh, viewers, please switch to your screens that it say speaker view or side by side so that you can see all the slides and the panelists as we're speaking. You'll all be muted, but you can use the chat feature to submit your questions when, when the presenters are speaking, and we'll get to those questions. For those who are interested in credits, um, please make sure that you participate in our random polls during the session and the evaluation at the end, because you must complete all three to be eligible for the credits. Uh, just so you know, all the slides will be, uh, the slide deck will be shared with you after the event. So I'm sure you all know how to get a cup of coffee and where the restrooms are located, so I don't need to go into that, but um, I'm ready to start the, real, the program. Thanks again for being with us. The Community Foundation stewards the legacies of York Countyans who cared deeply about this community and wanted to make a lasting impact. We have you to thank for trusting us as partners to carry out your clients' legacies. We are sincerely grateful that you partner with us and we appreciate that you are all ambassadors for charitable giving. Our goal is to be a resource for you. We are always available to discuss ways the Community Foundation can help your clients meet their charitable and their financial goals. The beauty of the Community Foundation is that we provide personalized service that's tailored to each person's vision for their charitable giving. We offer you a menu of op giving options and can facilitate even complex gifts. I think our sweet spot though is that we are very engaged in the community and we can help connect your clients more closely with the issues that they feel passionate about and with the charities that are addressing those issues. We hope you consider us as an extension of your team. We're ready to help you provide the best possible service for your valued clients. Next, I'd like to recognize some very special people. First, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors of today's event, the York County Estate Planning Council, Leave a Legacy York County, and the York County Bar Foundation. Their partnership helped us spread the word about this event and allows us to offer continuing education credits. This year especially, Victoria Connor and her team helped us make this online webinar meet the criteria for credits. When you register today for today's event, you should have received information on how to obtain your credits. Please make sure that we can see your name uh, so we know you have attended. If you need to reach out for more information, please call, uh, contact the Bar Foundation, and we've put their contact information in the chat area. Today, we're happy to induct the newest member of the Community Foundation's Professional Advisor Recognition Society. The Recognition Society honors these professionals for their commitment to advancing philanthropy and encouraging endowed charitable giving. Today's honoree is someone we worked with closely in 2019 to make his client's charitable wishes a reality. His name is Jeffrey Goss. Jeff is a partner at Brubaker, Connaughton, Goss, and Lucarelli in Lancaster. He helped to establish the firm in 2012. Jeff specializes in advising clients who are entering retirement communities with answers regarding asset protection and medical assistance, as well as adult guardianship matters and special needs trusts. Although his practice is across the river, his firm often works with clients from York County. One such client was Mabel Slifer. Mabel left a $1.8 million gift to the Community Foundation to support her two charitable passions, helping the less fortunate and animal welfare. Jeff and I worked closely for many months to finalize the fund agreements, and I was very impressed by his professionalism and his commitment to honoring Mabel's interests. Since we cannot be together today in person, Jeff joins us by video to share his story. Beyond being a client, she became a very good friend, um, someone that not only did I care for, but my family did as well. We used to make it a, a tradition on holidays to go see her. She didn't have, she had, as, as she would say, she outlived most of the people around her. Um, she did not let live me, obviously. Um, so we would take our dogs to go see her at different holidays and um, you make those holidays a little special for her. And, and she was special for us. She had a big impression, 
especially on my kids. She has so much wisdom over the years. Um, you know, she was, you know, the type of person that she always wanted to take care of the less fortunate and, and certainly, you know, loved animals, wanted to give back to the SPC, SPCA and the Salvation Army were two of her main causes, but she really spread the wealth. I mean, she was someone that if someone came to the door, um, she always had a donation. So she became very popular with the, with the door-to-door -door crowd. Um, but she was wonder, wonderful and, and very giving. Um, you know, she, she spent half her, her life, um, actually half a century, in Philadelphia, but she always called York her home. I mean, that's where she's from, and she always talked about that. And um, in fact, when she lived at, at a Lancaster County retirement community, she always said that if, if I had my druthers, she'd go back to York, um, but she was just too old to move. So that was really what, you know, she was founded in York, and, and she really felt that that was her home. And, and she sat down with me in, in creating an estate plan. Um, you know, my job is just to collect her values, and those are relatively obvious. She wanted to give back to her community, and York was center, um, central to who she was. And so with my help, I helped her craft an estate plan that gave it a lot of flexibility. She wanted to create a, a foundation or a donor advised fund to continue the kind of support she was already giving to, you know, animal rights causes um, and, you know, to those in need, the, the homeless and, and the people that needed help. And so, you know, after she passed away, you know, I had created this flexible estate plan to provide for those causes. And, you know, I was just lucky enough um, through some discussions that I, that I landed myself with the York County Community Foundation and Jane really helped me work through exactly what May was. I mean, the neat part was, is we, over a course of actually a couple years, developed, you know, a donor advised fund that really is May um, and accomplishes her wishes for many years to come. And I know that if she was here today, she just would be delighted to see her passions in place. I mean, they gave me support, guidance, they gave me creative ideas that I didn't even know in my you know, 25 years of practice. They really had the, the depth of knowledge and charitable giving in their counsel to really develop more than I would have guessed um, we would have had when we started this process. Um, so she you know, created funds to dedicate you know, for her two main causes. And, and so her two main causes are the homeless, the poor, the hungry, provide homes for them, um, you know, to, to be taken care of, um, to help those homeless, as she always did during her life. And then her second cause was abandoned um, animals, um, to curb the cruelty to animals in York County. And so she created a fund that, that dedicated, you know, for those causes, um, including the Salvation Army and the SPCA specifically. And I know that if she was here today, I don't think she could have imagined how much good um, she's taken care of today and then going forward. So, you know, on my behalf, I'm just honored to be part of the York County Community Foundation's Professional Advisor Recognition Society, if you can say that in one mouthful. And I just hope to partner with them again in the future. They've been immensely helpful and they bring more to the plate um, than I would have ever guessed. Thank you. Well, I want to just thank Jeff, uh, not only for helping us with um, Mabel's estate, but also for creating that video. He, he, really, he really does epitomize the type of caring professional that we'd like to spotlight. And what you may not have heard is just how he and his family spent um, the holidays with Mabel because she had no other children, and how he really got to appreciate her as, as, a, as an older, white, wise woman and how much she had an influence over his children. So he really got um, close to her. And so that's why he was really so passionate about helping her legacy live on in the ways that she wanted to. So congratulations, Jeff, for being inducted into our uh, Recognition Society. And thank you so much for your help in creating a vibrant our county. If you are a member of the Community Foundation's Professional Advisor Recognition Society, this is the time in the program, if we were together, where I'd normally ask you to stand up and wave and so we can recognize and thank you all. Instead, I'm going to encourage everyone to visit the Community Foundation's website at yccf.org, go into the advisor section, and you'll get a chance to see the photos and descriptions of each of the society members. So again, thank you so much for helping um, make your counties achieve the charitable goals they have. On that out, I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to our, our staff. Um, I really want to recognize our staff because every single day they are committed to inspiring charitable giving, understanding the most critical community needs, targeting grant making towards the highest and best use, and building endowment for future generations. This year, I'd like to make sure you meet our development team. Many of you know 
Dorinda Grove as development administrator. Dorinda supports our team, our donors, and all of you with timely responses and a dose of her friendly York County charm. Her background as a legal secretary means she speaks your language. Philip Woods is our newest addition to our team. He spent the first 15 years of his career as a professional financial advisor. He joined YCCF in March and as, a, as our gift planning officer. Although his first six months Although his first six months with the foundation have been under unusual circumstances, Phil has jumped right in to cultivate relationships with our donors and provide guidance to fund holders and legacy society members. In January, Mary Kay Bernoski joined YCCF as Vice President of Development. She comes to us as the previous CEO of Safe Burks, a nonprofit serving victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. She holds a law degree from the College of William and Mary Law School and an MBA in nonprofit management from Alvernia University. Mary Kay's experience in building relationships is expanding the community foundation's reach across York County by engaging people from all walks of life in the joy of giving back to their community. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Kay Bernoski, who's gonna introduce our speaker. Hi, Jane. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, congratulations, Jeff, on your well-deserved induction into the Community Foundation's Professional Advisor Recognition Society. I'm sorry about the uh, technical difficulties, but I was able to view Jeff's video, and he spoke very movingly about the conversations that he had with May, what, who he called May, Mabel Slifer, about what she truly wanted to leave as her legacy to both the community that she loved and to help vulnerable people and animals. It was really moving, so I, I do appreciate that, Jeff, and I know you plan to be with us today, so I hope you are here, and congratulations again. But Jeff's story epitomizes what we are all trying to do, and that is having meaningful conversations with our clients so that we can understand what their real goals are for themselves, for their family, and for the causes in the community that they want to see an impact after their own lifetime. And that's why I'm very grateful to be here at the York County Community Foundation, because we are here to help you have those meaningful conversations with your clients, to provide whatever resources, tools, or support that you need to have those great conversations and to help turn those passions into their legacy. Phil, Dorinda, and I, as well as everyone in our, all of my colleagues at the Community Foundation are working at 100% capacity so please don't hesitate to reach out to us to be, offer any support that we may be able to. As you know, this has been, as the Chinese proverb would say, an interesting time to start a new position in a new community. Um, but I am really looking forward to deepening our relationships with you all and hope that we'll get back in together again very soon. I regret that we were not able to meet in person and share a breakfast today, but I do want to thank you for spending a portion of your day with us. And I think that you will enjoy the program that we have for you today. Our speaker today is Phil Cubetta. His credentials and experiences are truly impressive, so I am going to be reading a lot of those for you now. Phil is the Sally B. and William B. Wallace Chair in Philanthropy at the American College and is responsible for the Chartered Advisor in Philanthropy, or CAP, curriculum. Prior to joining the American College, Phil served as Chief of Staff for the Nautilus Group a service of New York Life Insurance Company, providing estate, business, and philanthropic strategies to affluent clients through 200 of the company's top agents. Phil's numerous essays on philanthropy have appeared in Inspired Legacies, The World We Want, New Dimensions in Philanthropy and Social Change, and Doing Well, Doing Good, Readings for Thoughtful Philanthropists. Phil currently serves on the Plan Giving Advisory Board for the Carter Center, which was established by Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. In 2012, he was, along with Charles Collier of Harvard, honored with the Fifth Ian Leadership Award by Advisors in Philanthropy. In that same year, he was also the Power of the Purse awardee for the advisor category from Dallas Women's Foundation. Phil will be guiding us today through the estate planning of J.D. and Mary Riley, who at age 70 are exiting their $18 million S-Corp with an eye to giving back to their community while also meeting their other goals for themselves and their family. Phil will also introduce you to the Chartered Advisory and Philanthropy designation and how that can help distinguish you as a professional advisor. 
Please join me in welcoming Phil Cubetta. Am I audible? We sure are. Okay, good. Well, this is a kind of a time traveling case study. We're, we're going to work with JD and Mary Riley under prior law when the state taxes were a much bigger issue. And we're going to work with them again under current law. And really the question is, can we close this case? Okay. It was created with a guy named Dave Holliday. Some of you may know him. I think he's one of the better, really one of the best estate planner, uh, number crunching wizards in the, in the field. So the numbers were crunched, but it turns out the case really didn't turn on the numbers. This is a couple, business owning couple. You probably know a lot of people like this. Uh, their net worth is about $22 million, but most of it is tied up in their businesses. They have two companies, Ultrastone Inc. and Ultrastone USA, and the Inc. version is local. It's a brick manufacturing company, and it's local, and that's the business they built, but it was successful enough that they franchised it around the country, and that's Ultrastone USA. They live relatively modestly for their net, net, their net worth, they, about 20000 a month after tax. They have three children, and they got five grandchildren. They have one child in the business, that's Garrett. And they were asked on the estate planning forms how they would like the chips to fall at their death. And they said, as between taxes, charity, and children, not surprisingly, they said they would like to leave zero in tax. They'd like to leave 25%, they said, to charity. And they'd like to leave the balance, 75%, to family. And that's what we did the planning around the first time around on this case. When we look at their causes, you see House of Worship, University, her university, Save Our Children, a local charity. Save Our Kids is a local neighborhood organization. They worked with Garrett when he was in high school. He was a charismatic football player, uh, was drinking and driving, almost killed a person. Uh, and they credit Save Our Kids with turning Garrett around. And they're big supporters, that's their biggest gift. Mary Riley serves on the board and they, they give to a host of other charities for a total of 5,000. So about 30,000 altogether. And that's a lot or a little. It's a lot. If you look at their, uh, at their income, 200,000 a year, it's not too much. If you look at their net worth, $22 million. This is their planning team. And you can probably recognize your role here. Their core team of advisors. And they're also nonprofit non players kind of on this playing field. There's Luciana from Save Our Kids. She's the executive director. She knows a lot about the family. She doesn't know much about money. There's Pastor John who heads up their house of worship. There's Bernadette who calls on them from their university. There's Chad from the Community Foundation. There's Lena who represents a religious foundation that's kind of upstream from Pastor John. So if there's a technical question, it can go from Pastor John about the gift to Lena. <clears throat> and there's Laura, who works for a national gift fund, like let's say Fidelity Schwab Vanguard. This was their original estate plan before anybody did any work on it. And um, you can see that on the taxes and expenses box, this is under prior law, we're kind of time traveling back. There was a significant estate tax worth planning around about four and a half million dollars. And that was a state tax and was also, I think it was income tax also on the sale of the business. Now the income tax bite here on the sale of the business is another three million. So there's about $7 million there of taxes. They said they didn't want to pay any, and there was planning to be done to reduce it. I'm not going to go through every box here, but the active ingredient here is a donor advised fund <clears throat> and a charitable lead trust. So what Dave did, the planner did, is he took the amount that was going to be taxable in their estate and put in a charitable lead trust to zero out the estate. And that lead trust pays into a donor advised fund, let's say at the community foundation. He also used the donor advised fund to do what he could to re reduce tax on sale of the business. So putting some of the donor advised fund, the land that sits on some of the stock. So that kind of complex planning was done. 
And it's significantly reduced. In fact, it zeroed out the estate tax and greatly reduced the income tax. So let me explain it now in kind of more human terms because that's a lot of boxes. It's early in the morning. So let's say we're presenting this to JD and Mary and they look at all the numbers we crunched and they look at the cash flow. They want to make sure they're not going to go broke in retirement. So yes, you have enough for yourselves. And yes, you can maintain your lifestyle on out to age 95, 100, 105. And your net worth is going to continue to grow. The children are going to get 5 million each or more. Yes, they've got three kids. The estate tax has gone away. Yes. And the income tax is reduced significantly. Yes. And JD wants to pay attention to the business. He, he started the business to use the comptroller. So we sell UltraStone, the local business, the, the franchise business for 12 million to an outside buyer. And we sell the land with it. And I put the land into a charitable fund, a donor advised fund before sale to avoid the gain. Yes. And we're also getting a deduction for doing this that offsets some of the gain on sale of the business. Yes. In my local business, I can sell it gradually over time to my employees and my own options so I can stay busy in the business if I want to. Yes. <clears throat> and our employees will eventually get the business, including our son, and they have to buy it out over a certain period of time. That's an IRS rule. <clears throat> and to get the heirs up to the target amount of $5 million each, we'll have to get new insurance. Yes. And you factored the premium into the cash flows so we know we can afford it without uh, ruining our lifestyle. Yes. <clears throat> and the lake house stays in the family. They wanted to make sure the lake house uh, stays in the family. Yes. And at death, the IRA and the 401k go into the donor advised fund. And that's a tax smart thing to do. Yes. But Mary is good with numbers. She's a comptroller. And what she's saying here is correct. And I could you know, give you all the numbers that were crunched, but it's very interesting. She's interpolating and she's correct. She says, so am I right? With a plan you're showing us here, we could afford to give $450,000 a year out of the charitable fund if we do this, do these transactions now and start funding this today, we could do that for 11 years, which is right, roughly our life expectancy. And then at our death, the children using that charitable lead trust could continue that kind of giving for another 18 years. And that's actually what it says. So the question is, under prior law, with these numbers crunched the way they were, Will J.D. and Mary now sign off? And if, if you've got your, your speaker on, if you can mute your speakers, I think we'll get a little bit of feedback here. Will they now sign off? Now, if we had more time, I'd take a poll and I would measure what you say. And it's really interesting. Uh, if you were to vote here, would you vote, yes, they're going to sign? Or would you vote, no, they won't? And what would be your reasons? I have asked this question of a lot of groups. And on balance, I would say, most say, no, they won't sign. Despite the fact we checked all the boxes on what they asked us to do. Now, Laura Malone is head of a donor advised fund company. She gave us some of the technicalities about using S corps with, with, with donor advised funds. If you're interested in the intricacies of that kind of planning, there's a very good book by Brian Klontz called Charitable Gifts and Non-Cash Assets. You can download that book if you want to get into the financial intricacies of um, S-corporations and donor advised funds. But here's Tony Macklin, who's a philanthropic consultant. He doesn't work on the tax issues. He works on the family issues and the impact of philanthropic dollars. His response was, my gut says to have them start with a larger gift to save our kids, the organization helped care it, rather than go through a donor advice fund because it hits at the heart of their passion. They like the idea of getting started sooner. They like the idea of keeping an eye on things. You know that with your business clients. And they could then choose to involve the children, particularly Garrett and grandkids in a conversation about the gift and the values it reflects. So he's coming from a very different place. Dr. Jason Franklin teaches philanthropy. He also has a foundation that's been in his family. 
And here's his input. I'm troubled because I see the Rileys moving too quickly into the numbers. If I was sitting at the table with them on the Texas moon, I would also strongly encourage them to find an additional advisor who can help them envision their future. And when I started getting comments like this, I thought this was going to be a case that would definitely close, could check all the boxes. And I thought it would demonstrate how smart Dave and I are. When I started getting, when I started getting this kind of feedback, I began to think maybe we had missed the point. This is Mark Alton who last year was president of NAPAC, National Association of State Planners and Councils. And here's what he had to say. How can they leverage the family wealth to promote individual and family flourishing? How specifically do they intend to grow and develop the most important assets they have, the individual and family, human, intellectual, and relationship capital, how can we use philanthropy to help them be the kind of people they want to be, show up in the way they want to show up, not just about the dollars? Jay Cherney is a therapist whose basic uh, uh, work involves the, the psychology of money. And he says, when I look at the rallies through a psychology lens, I see a family on the brink of a major transition, right? They signed the business to a whole new life. This change is a rich opportunity for learning and growth, but it's also potentially an emotional minefield. And those of you who have clients uh, at that age and stage moving through business transition, you know it's about so much more than the money because the business is almost like a child that you're now selling. This is Tim Belber. He now teaches the American College with me. He's an attorney. And he says, before going into a deep dive on strategies, JD and Mary need an advisor who can be a true thinking partner to help them create a vision of what they're trying to accomplish. Mark Weber, also an attorney, but he's a financial advisor. <laughs> he and I are very good friends. And he took me out to lunch in Omaha. <laughs> and in this very tactful way, he made this comment to me, you know, after I've invested a year and a half and a lot of money developing this case study. He said, people, Phil, people used to do these full financial plans, these comprehensive plans, 20 years ago, which is when I was doing it. <laughs> but most of my clients already have a plan and are constantly modifying it to meet changing circumstances. Help them make one decision at a time. Interesting. I also presented this to a group called Advisors in Philanthropy, AIP. And I got some very interesting feedback from them as well. Comments from that group. Some people said, yeah, it'll close because the plan meets their goals, but the majority said it probably won't because it's too complex and the Rileys can't digest it all, even though Mary Riley is quite sophisticated with numbers. Even so, it's too much to digest in one meal. Then John Warnick spoke, and he's the founder of Purposeful Planning Institute. He's an ACTEC attorney and one of the best. And his practices morphed from being just about the money to being about the money and the meaning. And here's what he said. And this went through me like a spear because he was so right. He said, are we planning for the heirs, with the heirs, or at the heirs? And I had to admit, Actually, we're planning at the years. We've not involved them in any way, shape, or form. And how's it going to go over with them when we start making philanthropic gifts and sell the business? So should we, should you, in cases like this, involve the children? And when? Or involve the children and the grandchildren? And when? Now, while the plan is still in flux, after the parents sign off, or as the business transition unfolds, or leave as much as possible as way of communication until death. What is the right time to do it? And if you have clients in this situation, you know this is a very, fair, fairly tormenting question because they want to make their own decisions. There may be some dissent from the kids, but if there's going to be dissent from the kids, better probably to get that out of the way while everybody's alive and can work through it. Now, this is Rod Zeeb. He runs an organization. He's also a very sophisticated tax attorney. 
He's founder of Heritage Institute, teaching this kind of three-dimensional planning. His suggestion is that we hold an alignment meeting at the Lake House, he calls it alignment meeting, to discuss, to clarify the family vision and how the plan fits with it and where philanthropy fits to get everybody on the same page before or immediately after the planning process. So how could we get to a better solution? I asked Patricia Angus this. She's a very sophisticated attorney who has worked with some of the leading uh, lights in the field and has extremely wealthy international clients and also is very plain spoken and a very good friend. And she's kind to me. You know, she's, this is a kind comment, but she's really straightening me out. She said, at first I found myself tempted, Phil, to jump into the planning like you're asking me to. But then I found myself needing to step back because when all the facts are laid out in front of you, it's so easy to think that a single plan or solution is possible. if It's a case study in a, in a course. But of course, we know that is not how things really work with one solution. Stepping back is vital, not just for the advisors, but also for the family. <laughs> and by stepping back, she said, I mean changing one's lens to see the broader picture, but also to take a deep breath and think about what can and should be done as well as when, how, and by whom. Thank you, Patricia. So I think we can say maybe it closed, maybe it didn't, but maybe we're on the wrong foot. So let's try again under current law. So one thing's for sure, JD is a few years older, Mary's a few years older. They can't keep going like this forever, regardless of what tax law is, they've got to find a way to transition that business and segue into a life that they want to lead after the sale. So we open it. And he takes out the old documents from his credenza. And he says, you know, now that I look over the plan you gave me a couple of years ago, I see it saved a ton of taxes, about four and a half million dollars. But, you know, who cares? We don't owe any now under current law. Now, somebody has to step forward here because this case can't continue to go sideways forever. JD can't keep it up forever. And the interesting point here, I think, is really who on these teams, whether it's going to be an advisor, a CPA, an attorney, a CLU, CHFC kind of person, somebody at one of the gift funds, somebody at community foundation, somebody at university, somebody's got to nudge this case back on track by touching a nerve. This is Todd Fithian. He runs an organization training advisors to do this kind of legacy work. And that's a great saying of his. To end in a different place, you've got to start in a different place. We have to start our process in a new way. So on this round, we're going to start with some reflections for the rod, not jumping right into planning, but provocative questions to get them think and reflect about what they're trying to accomplish. Then some thoughts on working with advisors, and then some thoughts on partnering with a nonprofit. But the active ingredient here really are the reflections. I find that when I gave these talks, this is the part that people want uh, to get after. So these are reflections, and these are, I think, largely the Riley's own work. These aren't fact finder questions. These are things they've got to resolve in their own mind, but we can put them in mind of it, and we can create a thinking space where they can begin to reflect. Give a talk like this years ago. Um, Michael O'Shaughnessy was there and he teaches ethics at San Ignatius College Prep School in San Francisco. He's a Jesuit priest. And he said to me, you know, your talk is about working with the wealthy and I probably should keep my mouth shut because I took a vow of poverty as a priest and I've kept it. <laughs> but, but your talk reminds me of these two questions we asked the kids in ethics class, you know, the high school kids. What kind of person do you want to be in what kind of world? Now, those aren't the kind of questions you can ask people, but those are the kind of questions they've got to answer for themselves as they think about their legacy plan. What kind of person do you want to be in what kind of world? It takes courage to put the conversation at that level, not with, it, not with high school kids when you're grading them, but with their parents who may be on your board. This is Jay Steenheisen. He was at one point uh, chairman of the National Conference of Philanthropic 
uh, CG, now it's called CGP, Charitable Gift Planning Association. He's raised money for Brown. He's raised money for other nonprofits. He now is a consulting firm. He worked for Harris Bank. He has some very wealthy clients. He likes to ask this question. Do you recognize any element of luck, blessing, or grace, J.D. and Mary, in your success? I'm pretty sure they're going to say yes. And the, whatever comes out of their mouth next is being to talk about it will give us some very significant clues about how to plan the case. If they say no, like Frank Sinatra, we did it our way, we own nothing to nobody, you probably don't have a philanthropic prospect. This is Peter Karoff, who founded the, the Philanthropic Initiative, one of the first philanthropic consulting firms. That's his book, where he interviewed very wealthy families around the world. And these are the questions he asks in the book. <laughs> if, if those of you who are, uh, you know, if, if you could mute, it would probably be helpful. Uh, Peter's questions, what is your vision of a better world? It's a wonderful blue sky question. People love to talk about that. Or what is your vision of a better hometown, a better York County? What conditions are needed to realize it? Now it's getting closer to planning. What are the obstacles like a SWOT analysis? And what parts of your vision of a better hometown or a better world are realistic? And what ideas, strategies, and plans can make it so? And now it's gearing into planning. And how much is it going to cost and when do you want to start? This is Tracy Gary, who's been a wonderful mentor to me. That's her book, Inspired Philanthropy. And these are her questions. And uh, I've tried to preserve her language because she's much more eloquent than I am. She grew up with money in the Pillsbury family. She got her inheritance early, like 20, 21. She gave it all away by the time she was 30. And she spent her career helping other people to make significant gifts. I love her first question here because it works for conservatives or progressives. What would you like to change or preserve in the world or in your hometown? Has past giving reflected your hopes? Now, I'm not sure exactly what she means by that, but I think she's suggesting that we're sometimes disappointed. What are the causes behind the issues? There are so many hungry children. We could feed them, but why are there so many? What are the causes? What might change the situation? And we're not going to change the world or even our hometown all by ourselves. Who joins us in this work? Other donors, family members, nonprofits, the community foundation. And probably you're not going to figure it out right away if you're trying to move the needle on a cause. So how will you experiment and revise and learn from experience? Great questions for J.D. and Mary. These two women founded a group called Vario Philanthropy in St. Louis. And here are the questions they ask. Do you have any debts of gratitude, J.D. and Mary? I suspect they would say yes. What would friends say is your soapbox? What do you want about? And you're giving to a smorgasbord of charities. Where might you sacrifice all that breadth for a little depth? to make a bigger difference. This is Joe Breitenecker. He was head of the Philanthropic Initiative after Peter Karoff, you saw earlier, stepped down. That's a Harvard t-shirt you see there, and that's a Harvard crest. He died not long after that photo was taken of pancreatic cancer, and he died with that kind of a smile. He was a wonderful, courageous man. Many of us have been told that we should do mission statements for our clients, and I think that's a good idea, but very few clients have the time for it, and it sometimes seems a little corporate. Joe had a way of cutting to the chase. He had the courage to challenge his donors. He would ask, if your family had a crest, what would be the motto? Give me two words, just two words you actually live by. He would also ask, you know, what keeps you awake at night about the world? This is Deanne Ewan. She works with me in the Charter Divide and Philanthropy Program at the Marin College. I was running these questions by her in a restaurant in San Francisco where she lived at the time. And she said, those are good questions, but I can give you another one that I ask with the women, often heirs from Asian families that I work with. I said, okay. 
She said, were there things you wanted to do in life that your father said you cannot? Well, I've, I've raised this, I've shown this slide to lots of different groups. And what I notice is everybody says, well, you know, that's because she's Asian and Asian cultures are like that. But I submit to you, many U.S. cultures are like that as well, because often we see our role as advisors as passing on the parents' values to the kids, as opposed to helping the kids develop their own. And if you raise that subject with your clients, you'll notice some really interesting conversations come out of it. Are you trying to give them your values or help them develop their own? Particularly with your business owning clients, right? They tend to be a little controlling. Now, this is Charlie Collier. He has a master's in divinity. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. He was a very good friend. I learned a huge amount from him. And those of you in estate planning, I think you're going to find this first question really interesting and maybe even a little bit disturbing because we're the ones doing the plans. And I, I did work in a planning operation for about 20, for about 17 years. And when I asked myself that first question, I didn't like the answer. What principles have guided your legacy planning to date? Now, that's a question for JD and Mary, but it's also a question for us as planners. What are the principles? And I submit to you that the way we've been trained, the principles are prudent, they're prudent, having enough for ourselves, always having more, protecting against predators and creditors. They're really cold. They're really cold and they're really important. We have a fiduciary responsibility to cover those bases for sure. But our clients' values and goals, hopes, dreams, and aspirations are not limited to just protecting or growing wealth. What principles guide JD and Mary as they think about what they'd like to be doing? Another question, what are you up against with your kids? Because the money can go to the kids and go to charity and go to taxes, but what are you up against with your kids? And they could begin to tell some of the stories about Garrett and how he's doing these days. And how wealthy do you want each of your children to be? Ask that question, you get interesting answers. Parents are very conflicted about that. For midlife and later life clients who are about to go through a transition, Jill, when you were younger, were there things you wanted to accomplish in life you have not yet done? And how might you get back to that while you still have time? Now, if she says, I'm running this business, I'm going to keep on running it, but I wish I could have been a concert pianist, maybe there's a way she can help somebody else be a concert pianist. Some of our unrealized dreams can be lived out through philanthropy by helping others do it, or she could take a hard turn in her own life and begin to work on things that are undone. I think a good question for those of you who are doing um, planning with numbers, or quantitative planning, you finish your standard planning routine like I did with Dave Holiday, and all the numbers have been crunched appropriately. But before you ask for the signature, you say, beyond self and family, beyond your business, beyond your money, is there anything else in the world on which you'd like to have a positive impact while you're alive or after you're gone? You ask that question and you'll find your border plate plan doesn't really fit it because they have so many things they would like to accomplish if we only ask them. Now, this is Sharna Goldsecker. She's an heir, I believe, in the Bronfman family, you know, several levels deep, several generations deep. That's her book, Generation Impact, How Next-Gen Donors Are Revolutionizing Giving. And she's talking about philanthropic identity across generations. You have to, you have to understand her generational position to understand her question. She's the recipient of a multi-generational a wealth transfer. She's saying, what legacy have I received from one of the most famous families in North America, the, the Seagram's family, basically? What legacy have I inherited from them, my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents? And how does that legacy inform who I am and how I see the world? What makes me different when I live in the shadow of those who went before me? This is Jenny Santee. That's her book, The Giving Way to Happiness. And she likes to ask, who's your giving tribe? Now, I don't think JD and Mary really have a giving tribe, and I think they could use one a group of people they think about and talk about their philanthropy, and maybe that's some of the community foundation could help them tap into, help them find a giving tribe. Now, this is Rabbi Mordecai Levy. Some of you may know him because he lives in this area. He lives in the Philadelphia area. He's a rabbi. He's also a rabbi who teaches fundraising. <laughs> and uh, 
this is his question. I, I, I must have read this probably a hundred times. Every time I do, I have to take a deep breath because I know the hair on the back of my neck is going to stand up. This is the true prophetic voice. Your last will and testament is your final teaching. What do you want it to say? We are operating in this territory every time we do an estate plan, but do we recognize, do we acknowledge how important that final teaching is? Now, working with advisors is going to be necessary for sure. We need you in this kind of a planning operation. We, you have got to do your bit because we have to answer the following questions for the Rodleys, and these are quantifiable, and these will push your technical capacities. How much do JD and Mary need for themselves? We don't want to bankrupt them with giving. How much is the right amount for each kid? And what will be left over as our legacy? The first question you know is a present value exercise and cash flow. Who can answer that? Well, you can. The CPAs, the tax advisors, the financial advisors. And when I did that calculation with Dave Holiday, I'm going to give you the answer. What they need to be financially secure for the rest of their lives is this $10,198,684. Okay. That is the exact number, according to Dave. Might be off by 5%, but it's less than what they have. The point is, it's less than what they have. And furthermore, when you project the numbers, withdrawing their cash flow, spending the money, do all that stuff, they're going to go from 20 million or so today to $30 million at life expectancy, the way things are going, with very conservative planning assumptions. So, how much of that money? at life expectancy should go to the years. If they each got a third, three kids, that's $10 million. At 5%, that's $500,000 a year for each kid who are 375 after taxes. Note that JD and Mary are living on 220. So they could leave their kids better off than they are in terms of cash flow and lifestyle, but do they want to do that? I submit to you probably not. One way to get at it is to actually do a final spending spree, we call it. Walk them through a list of things, the money that the kids inherit could be used for. How much of a house do you want to buy them? Just a down payment or the whole house? A vacation house, an education fund, a retirement fund, enough so they can get started on a retirement fund and contribute throughout their lifetime or enough so they could retire the, they could retire the day you die? One car, two cars, three cars, jewelry, vacation fund, private clubs, most clients, given this kind of a list, will decide that there is a max they want the kids to get. And most of us are planning to give them the most possible. The parents are going to say, mm, I'm not so sure in many cases. So let's say the net worth is 30 million at death. They s decide through this exercise, five million to each of three kids. That leaves 15 million for charity. And that becomes a significant planning amount. Now we're planning for $15 million of giving someday, some way, somehow. And that requires a different kind of planning. So we might have an alignment meeting on the lake house at the lake house to make sure everybody's on the same page with the way this plan is going to play out if we go down this road with 15 men to charity some way, someday. We could give the kids an update on the business sale, particularly Garrett, who's in the business. We give them an update on the retirement plans, update on how, they, how the inheritance amount was chosen so they don't feel insulted, update on how much philanthropic capital is available and some thoughts on how to use it and the invitation to the family to disperse that money in a meaningful way, to make meaningful decisions about how that 15 million is going to be dispersed. So imagine after that first lake house meeting, they do have a multi-generational meeting and this little child is given the ability to give away a small amount of money, maybe $500 or maybe $1,000 with her and her brothers. And I imagine her coming back and saying to J.D. and Mary, Grandpa and Grandma, my brother and me, we want to save dogs. And I can imagine her coming back a year later and saying, Grandma and Grandma, we shouldn't give to that shelter again. They didn't do what they said they'd do. This year, let's help little kids who don't have enough. Now that child is farther along the philanthropic learning curve than anybody else in this case study. She's being to think strategically, even though she's only giving away $1,000 a year. I can see the heart being touched by this progress and JD and Mary feeling differently about the plan. And I can see them deciding to do it. 
So let's recap. How did the Rileys do? They, we met all their goals for tax planning, personal security, business exit. The heirs are getting the exact amount the parents deem appropriate. Garrett te- keeping his job because the business is being bought out by the employees. There's $5 million in the donor advised fund right away so they can advise on and more as time goes on. How did advisors do? Extremely well. These are extremely lucrative cases. CPA did the planning, significant planning fee. The advisor got 18 million new assets under management as the business is sold. There's new insurance we put into the plan to bring the kids up the inheritance amount, $40,000 premium, new wills and trusts, legal agreements to sell the business, fee for a business exit coach, fees for qualified appraisals, fee for conducting the family meeting. So advisors did really well. How did charities do? They were getting 30,000 a year. Now we've got an additional thousand dollars going out to save dogs. And even a six year old knows it's not working. So let's take a nonprofit perspective. This is Vicki Wilson who runs a nonprofit. And she says to work well with people like the Rileys, the foundation is going, once they have their foundation, we have to be more strategic. In addition to a good relationship with the donors, they're going to expect, they will expect more program information, more financial reporting. They're going to, to be more strategic in working with us. They're going to want us to be more accountable, whatever nonprofit they work with. We've got to be better prepared to work with donors who are better informed, experienced, and more focused on impact. And we've got to recognize the need to become more open and responsive to donor input, ideas, and strategies. And we've got to be more transparent. So this is the kind of connection you can make directly with a nonprofits or through the York Community Foundation. So you begin to put the conversation around how the money is gonna be used to achieve impact through a specific organization and what degree of input and control the family wants. They may want more access to the board. They may want more access to the exec director. So opportunities to connect the organization, to connect the organizations of volunteer, trustee, or an advisor are to be expected. You can help arrange that. So planning for action from your seat at the table, and I'm closing, I'm wrapping up here. You know these people. (laughs) You know the Rileys in this county. Closely held business owners, boomers, good-hearted people who grew up here, they're gonna be buried here. They want their kids to stay here if possible. They built their business here. But they're also donors who have no idea how generous they can be given the right tools and your informed guidance. And they don't know how much they'll enjoy it by the kind of impact they have. So what have you learned that you can share with your best clients and donors to help them achieve not just their baseline goals, but also their highest aspirations? So this is really the kind of work I do. If you would like more information, I think we may be organizing a group of people here uh, to study CAP together. This is my program. If you have more inter- if any interest in that, we'd love to talk to you about it. But thank you very much for your attention. I want to make sure I end promptly on the hour because I know many of you bill by the hour and you've got places to go. But I am available for questions for another 15 minutes or so. But thank you very much for your attention. Uh, all, if you would like to turn your videos on, keep yourself on mute. And Phil, thank you for stopping the screen share. Um, Folks, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And Sarah Thomas from the uh, Community Foundation will be moderating. I guess I got a question for you as you're meditating on it. Was this what you expected or is this different or? Um, Phil, are you talking to me, Victoria? Well, really to the audience. Is there, okay. there reflecting on questions? My, my question to you would really be, um, is this the way you do planning or the way you could do or should do or might do or how does it grab you? Well, speaking for me, I thought it was a, an excellent program and I really appreciate it. It gave us a lot to think about. And again, those conversations are what's important. How to get people to think about what their goals truly are for themselves, their family and their community um, after their lifetime. Um, 
sometimes those are difficult conversations to have. So I like the questions that you gave. They're very um, precise and, and usable to start those conversations. So thank mm -hmm. you. Mary and maybe others, given those questions are not tax and legal, and they're not financial planning questions, who's in the best position to take the risk of raising one? <laughs> right. I think this is a game open to talent. I think this is the, 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 the key really here is uh, empathy and courage. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. You know, to put, be able to put yourself in that an other's position and the there but for the grace of God go I perspective. But I really did like having the conversation about what you want the world to look like. You know, what is it that you want to change? Um, what is it that you want to see happen? Mm -hmm. What could be different mm -hmm. given your contribution? I just think that's, that's, that's what we all want to see. We want to see that our lives have made an impact and we want to be able to help others do that, you know, right. have those conversations mm -hmm. and be able to say, you know, this is possible for you. I think what's so interesting about this group, and it's hard to do it long distance, so I can't read all your faces and stuff. But I don't think we can do this as solo practitioners or even part of a firm because it's cross-disciplinary. Uh, we're not done until that money hits a nonprofit that does great things more than, you know, saving a dog or two. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, but, not, right. but, but the community foundation can't get to the 15 million that's implicit in this case themselves without your help as advisors. They cannot even begin to get to it because the Rileys are thinking, hey, $30,000 a year is a lot for us. <laughs> Absolutely. They're actually capable of 450000 forever, but their advisors have to work with them to reassure them. But who starts, who starts this chain reaction, I guess I'm asking. And there is no one right answer, but it's really important that somebody does. Right. And I think from our perspective, we'd like to have these conversations with our professional advisors and help them start those conversations because, again, they already have the relationship with their clients. And this is a good way to deepen that relationship for them. The other thing I'd like to say, I, mean, if, I'm, I, I, I do this all day long and I, you know, I stop doing it on this video, I'll start doing it again you know, <laughs> for myself. But I think one of the really interesting issues that underlies why the field hasn't moved more deeply in this direction, it has to do with the profit model, the business models that we as advisors have. Our time is valuable. Your time is billed by the hour. That is valuable time. These conversations take time. And as a kind of a pro tip, if the community foundation is willing to conduct these conversations for you, you're not billing for that, but the billing rate for that might be zero. Right, exactly. It may well be zero. And you, it's like quicksand. Once you start raising those questions, it's very hard not to you know, spend the time needed to address them. So if you can bring your client to the community foundation, not just for the tax, not just for the donor advised fund or the impact, but for those preliminary conversations, if they're willing to have those conversations and the family conversations, I think the teamwork side of this is really where the success comes as an advisor. It's not by trying to become the equivalent of a community foundation kind of a person yourself. It's handing off. All right. And I see that Jim Shank has joined us and I know he is, um, been part of the CAP program. So I don't know, Jim, if you have any um, any insights that you can offer about the program and how it's helped you. I think you're muted, Jim. There you go. Yes, well, I, uh, I have found that program to be extremely valuable. Um, it can easily be done over one year and it's all online. I never saw Phil in person, but I saw and heard his voice throughout. Um, so it's a three course program and uh, uh, very, very helpful for me as a working in philanthropy to see, to have the perspective of a CPA or a legal person uh, and see how all of that works together, financial advisor. So I, I very much recommend it. Thank you. I think, I think the point to make here too, Jim, you know, it is a somewhat lonely thing doing the course by yourself and you do learn a lot that way. And I appreciate the testimonial, but it's so much more valuable in my opinion, if you can go through this with others from other seats at the planning table. 
so that we're not just talking about teamwork, we're actually building teams and we're bringing live cases to the, to, the, to the table and so forth. So if there is an impulse here as coming out of this presentation for some of you to get together and take CAP together, the real benefit is taken together in such a way that you can uh, learn from each other much more so than from me. So I wanted to jump in. There is one question in the chat room. Okay. Uh, and, and again, I'll, I'll say mm -hmm. thank you as well for that excellent presentation and, and wonderful insight. The question posed was, did they ever sign off on the plan? Did it change? Has it continued to change, right? Yeah, you know, that's a good point. This, this is a fictional case, but I, I would visualize it changing. The very important constituents that would change it because you're down to the dawning recognition that we can give away $15 million at some point, and we're giving away 30000 plus 1000 for dogs. That plan, that they, their way of life is going to change as they get more and more involved in the community. And that we need the community foundation or somebody else to be a bridge to that because right now it's so abstract. It's all numbers and family meetings where nobody knows very much about the topics. But I can see, you know, Jane smiling because really they need a guide now towards that phase of the planning where the money begins to have impact. And that will then cycle back to, to their, their financial planning because they want to liberate more dollars sooner rather than waiting to die the likely impact will be they'll decide to liberate more dollars sooner because they don't want to wait. Nobody really wants to wait until death to have impact. I'll ask any other advisors joining us today, if you have any other questions, feel free to use the chat group, the group chat to submit your questions. We do have a couple minutes left that Phil's willing to give us. While we're waiting for the questions, I'll just mention that, you know, one of the things that stands out to me, Phil, is really about listening. And um, I think some of us can always get eager to kind of get to the conclusion as fast as possible. And you know what, when people feel rushed, they don't feel, they don't feel as trusting. So thank you for reminding us to sort of take our time and, and really get to their, their essence of what they'd like to accomplish. Well, thank you so much. I had, I had a wonderful comment from Emily Clark, and I don't think she, she shared it privately, but I don't think she'd mind it, my sharing it publicly. She was thanking me for CAP and saying that what she really enjoyed most was the literary and Quaker references around listening. <laughs> because if you think about it, we're all trained to have answers. I mean, we're trained in school that somebody's going to pay us because we have the answers. <laughs> and until we get the answer part, we're not doing our job. But on this case, somebody makes their job to listen the Rileys <laughs> into deciding what they want to do. And Quaker. Quaker style, and it can take time, and that's that's really the business challenge. It's, this kind of plan does take time, and I think it is a team exercise. But the listening part is for sure the hardest and the most important. Well, I'm amazed I've held your attention this long, and how if you were still online, so I, I feel like it's been a good day. <laughs> Well, Phil, I'm going to say, while well, any other final thoughts come in from our, our group here, I will say on behalf of the York County Community Foundation and, and our professional advisors in attendance, thank you for your time, uh, your, your willingness to join uh, and present valuable in information, the questions you posed, uh, thought-provoking on my end. I know personally I'm going to go home to my seven and nine year old and ask them what our family crest needs to look like. That is fantastic. Uh, what, <laughs> have them draw it. Yeah. And what, they can use what, Latin if they know Latin for the words. Yeah. And, and what two words pop out and there's yeah. two of them. So two words, they each get one. <laughs> that's that's uh, a great idea. I love that idea. I, I appreciate it. And again, I hope our professional advisors can take something away too. I'm sure they have. Uh, I did want to say, as, as mentioned before, our development team, Mary Kay, myself, Dorinda, uh, to the professional advisors in attendance today, we're viewing this, uh, certainly reach out. We're here to help you. We can provide guidance on current issues. We can work together with you. Uh, information on charitable gift annuities, remainder trust, other plan giving tools. Uh, we wanna be that resource and, and certainly capable of being that resource to help you during these conversations with clients such as the Rileys. So as you engage with your clients, hopefully you'll consider us to be part of that conversation, part of that planning process, and together we can uh, better serve our shared community. So. Once again, thank you, uh, Phil, for your presentation. Thank you to the professional advisors for joining us today. And certainly work, uh, look forward to working with all of you in the future. Uh, I, I didn't see any other questions at this point. Uh, Phil, I'll, I'll just uh, to uh, make you uh, aware, there were two comments. Thank you, Phil. 
that, that's you, Phil, not me, Phil. Uh, really great presentation and information. Grateful for your insights. Uh, another comment, great presentation. Thank you for taking time, taking the time to go through it with us. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but I find this extremely gratifying when you find people who are willing to be more generous. We're not trying to make them generous if they're not. When you think about how the world is suffering right now, if it's in our clients to do it, they can afford to do it and they want to do it, and we can be the catalyst to make that happen, and we can do it as part of our business model and find the community. What, what could be better as far as our own contribution to the community? So anyway, it's, it's really a privilege to be with you, and thank you very much. And Phil, I'll ask, it, you mentioned the CAP program. Should they direct the questions directly to you, or should, should we uh, field those questions directly from the financial advisors? Why, why don't or, you or the professional advisor, see if that's critical mass for people to study it together? I think that they will, they will be best served because we can, you can do the, a, a conversation after each lecture. You listen to like, lectures are recorded. You can get together once a week or every other week to discuss them. And you could, commu you could set that up the same way we've got this call going. So why don't you see if there's critical mass, if they call you and if, you know, you obviously can then de deflect them back to me if you need to. Wonderful. If there's Thank critical you. mass for them to go through it together, they're, they're going to get so much more out of it because they become each other's biggest asset. Wonderful. Thank you. Any final questions from our group? Just a minute or two. Final thoughts from anyone? Jane, Victoria, any final comments for the group? No, just that I like Tim Bupp's mask. <laughs> Me too. Uh, thank you all for your partnership with the York County Bar. Uh, the work of the York County Community Foundation in our community is incredibly important. and We so greatly appreciate the partnership. Uh, Phil Cabetta, thank you so much for uh, your patience today with our technical um, issues and all of you. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, and I look forward to uh, sending over the uh, edited version and the real video um, with the honoree so that everyone can enjoy uh, all of the above. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Bye-bye.